Hello, this is Brian Rowe with Mythic MTG Tech. I'm here with James Johnson, local <laughs> legacy expert on RUG. We're going to do a deck <laughs> tech today on the RUG deck. It is definitely one of the tier one legacy decks, and James is one of the strongest people playing it here in the Northwest. Uh, let's run through. James, how many lands does this deck run? So the deck pretty much hasn't wavered from when it was initially created. You run six duels, three volcanic and three chop split. And then you have eight fetch lands. Um, it doesn't really matter which ones they are, so long as they're just blue or they could be wooded foothills. Doesn't matter. Um, there is some reason to run, like you can run flooded strand and deltas if you want to go into a tournament where people don't know what you're on. You can present those, and then they might not be thinking you have stifle. So we'll get to that later. Okay, so you're actually only running six mana producing lands in the whole deck? Yes, six. Um, so how many lands can you keep for an opening hand? Um, ideally, you want one or two fetches. If you have anything more than that and it's like three lands, it might be keepable. But you really want to have like two lands, a cantrip, a threat... And then some disruption in terms of either like removal or counter spells, something along those lines. Okay. Um, so all of your fetches currently fetch islands? Yep. So it doesn't matter. Any of these can get any of my duels, whichever I need at that given moment. Okay. What other lands are you running in there? Uh, then we have Wasteland, which isn't really a land. It's just stone rain against non-basic lands. That's all it's really for. The only things it casts main deck are Goyf, and even that, you just don't ever really need to play a Wasteland to cast it. You usually have two mana at that point, since he's the higher-end threat. And then. So next, you're running Stifle in the deck. Let's talk about Stifle for a minute. Um, what? How does Stifle work? What do you use it against most common? So ideally, Stifle, you, ideally in Magical Christmas Land, you waste their duels and you Stifle their fetches, and you're the only one playing Magic. Um, so it's often the, a Stone Rain. Yes. Ideally, it's a Stone Rain on a fetch, though it has a lot more applications than that. Against Miracles, I consider this a pseudo counter, because if you have a threat out and you Stifle their Terminus trigger, then they draw a very expensive Miracle card and have to filter it back onto the top somehow and waste like a Brainstorm and another turn or turn and a half trying to do that. So it's definitely a tempo, tempo play there. Um, against decks that run Stoneforge Mystic, you can stifle the Living Weapon trigger on Batterskull, which also just buys you time. That's pretty much the only main deck answer or like sort of answer against matter school that you have so when you trigger when you counter the living weapon trigger what happens uh they just have a very nice piece of equipment that costs five mana to equip and hopefully if wastelands have done their job or they just don't have five lands then we don't care because they spend three mana bouncing it back to their hand and another two mana replaying it with stoneforge mystic ideally by then they're either dead or we've killed Stoneforge Mystic and Batter Skull's irrelevant at that point. Okay. So that's again Stoneforge Mystic. Again, it's Miracles. Is there anything else worth um, stifling in Miracles? Uh, against Miracles, uh, you mainly want to save it for the Miracle cards. I found that trying to mana deny them is just not very profitable. They run enough basics at Wasteland isn't that good against them and they just have so many lands that stifling a fetch isn't that profitable i've found like if i can and i think my mana denial plan will get there maybe i have like dazes and pierces in hand then i'll do it but i usually think saving them for their uh terminuses to keep our threats on the board is better mm -hmm. uh, what about a deck like jund what's worth stifling there Against Jun, there's a few different things. Uh, Cascade, that also goes hand-in-hand -hand against Shardless Bug. Stifling a Cascade trigger is good because then they're just paying their 
paying like four or three mana for more or less to bear with haste that we don't really care about. Uh, you can also stifle Liliana Edict effects, which are really good if you uh, have a goose out, which we'll get to later. But if they're trying to deal with your goose and you stifle their Edict effect, they probably just wasted a turn to play out Liliana and then have it just die. So it's definitely a very flexible card, uh, very skill intensive. You can also get people by stifling uh, death rate activations. A lot of people that don't play against Stifle regularly don't know that he his first ability isn't a mana ability, so you can Stifle it. And depending on how they tap, they might be telling that they're going to Abrupt Decay. So you can maybe gain another turn with your clock, but that's still very corner case. So death rate's first ability is exile a land and gain a mana because it targets a land. Yes. Stifle it. Yes. Uh, mana abilities cannot target, so you can stifle those. Okay. Um, anything worth stifling in elves? Elves. Uh, it's elves is confusing. They. There's not a whole lot because the thing is the all their activated abilities between Corian Ranger and Wirewood Symbiote are the main advantage to them is that they're bouncing an elf and usually blanking your removal. But the bouncing elf part is the cost for that ability. So you're not actually like keeping the threat that you're trying to kill in play. They're just stifling their untapped mana dork trigger, which you don't really care about. You might be able to stifle Crater Hoof, but sadly enough, a 5 5 can kind of just beat Rug. <laughs> okay. What is one of your favorite stifles that you've done? I know I've done some very silly things to get to Threshold, one of which does include stifling my own fetch lands. <laughs> <laughs> if I just. Felt like I was very far ahead. Um, aside from that, I have gotten Stifle Flooded sometimes. And if the opponent gets GT out and they're trying to race you with, like, even if it's a true name equipped with GT, and you Stifle the counter activation when uh, the creature connects with you, then they just paid four mana to play and equip an artifact that literally does nothing. And I've found that to be somewhat profitable if you just get flooded out with stifles because then you're hopefully still beating them over the head with something and they're just attacking you with a threat that's probably like a 1-2 death right or stoneforge and they're gaining no value off of their GTA. So you mentioned that it gains you time. This deck's often referred to as a tempo deck. What does that mean? So tempo is basically your utilizing your playing out a threat and then also proactively disrupting what they're doing. It's sort of like a mini control deck almost because you're playing efficient threats to kill them quickly and you're also gaining tempo by running a lot of cheap counter spells to like force them. You're putting enough pressure to force them to do something and then you're proactively countering whatever they're trying to do, whether that's with Stifle, Force, Daze, Spell Pierce. There's a number of different things you can do to disrupt your opponent. Okay. And so long as you have a threat out, that's all that really matters. So do you need to keep a threat in your opening hand? I would say if you're just picking up the deck, that's definitely a rule of thumb. After you get more experience with the deck, you can start to keep hands that seem kind of sketchy so long as it has like a cantrip and you believe that you'll be able to find a threat within i'd say the first two turns you'll do okay if it's just three counter spells two bolts two lands that probably won't get you very far so you really need a ponder or a brainstorm something like yeah that you look at three or four more cards yeah keep like deciding if a hand's keepable with this deck is fairly easy the you want to make sure you have at least one or two lands and it needs to either have some sort of threat or a cantrip. Then everything else is just disruption. Okay. Uh, let's keep cruising through the deck. What have we got next? So next we have our removal suite, which right now I'm running 
two fork bolts in uh, two out of the six flex spots. Mm -hmm. This I find to be the best uh, removal spell to run in the flex spot because it's one mana. You might gain, like, you might get a two for one. That doesn't happen too often. But the thing is, a lot of the threats that Rug needs to deal with, like Delver, Stoneforge Mystic, Deathrite Shaman, uh, Mother of Runes, all of those you have to kill on site. And I've found the other main contender for uh, flex spot removal, Fire and Ice, to be two mana intensive at two mana because you want to be able to kill Delver, Deathrite, and Mother of Ruins the turn they come out. If they get to untap with those threats, the game becomes much harder. And just having all your removal at one mana makes it much easier to keep that going. Okay, what else have you got for one mana removal? So after that, we just have four bolts, which is just self-explanatory. It's one of the reasons to play Rug. It's not only a removal spell, but added reach. Um, you can also deal with Planeswalkers this way if they decided to Edict with Liliana to get rid of your Goyf. And let's say you stifled it, then on your turn, you can bolt their Liliana and make your Goyf bigger and then still attack them. So it's just very flexible removal. It's definitely up there as one of the best removal spells in Legacy. What have we got next? So next we have our cantrips, um, which for starters we have brainstorms. Uh, I would consider this either the hardest or second hardest card behind uh, Stifle to play in this deck. Ideally, this card isn't like played like it is in other more mid rangey decks like Esper Deathblade or Miracles, where you're just kind of filtering. In this deck, it's almost always you want to cast it as Ancestral Recall, which means that you either have excess threats or lands in hand and some sort of fetch to shuffle them away. Okay. So so what you're saying is you really need two dead cards in your hand, cards that you no longer need or aren't right for the matchup, plus a fetch land that hasn't been cracked yet. Yes. Ideally, sometimes it's just very straightforward that, oh, I have a dead card and a fetch in hand. Right now is a good time to brainstorm. Other times it might be that you're backed into a corner that you need to find like red mana to cast removal on a spell. So you just burn a brainstorm quickly to try and get your removal active. But ideally you've like, because the deck only needs two lands in play, anything after two lands, you just want to be shuffling away with your fetch lands and brainstorms. You mean you, you don't try to put five land in play to hard cast four? No. Ideally, okay. <laughs> if that's happening, you're probably losing the game. I, I've done it, but it's not Definitely very not common bad. and okay. very bad. <laughs> okay. Um, what do we got next? So next... We have Spell Pierce, which this is uh, another two out of the six flex spots. Um, it's just a very useful counter spell that is good early game, which is where this deck thrives. It can deal with a lot of different threats from either a counterbalance that Miracles is trying to resolve to something like Liliana or a Hymn to Turok. Just anything um, you can... if. You have a Delver out, this is one of your best removal spells to protect it in the early stages of the game against Bolt or Swords to Plushers. So it's definitely, I consider, one of the best uh, counter spells that you could be running in this deck. Mm. And then, so next, we have Days. And Days is hopefully just counter spell in this deck because you just play it for the alternate cost of returning an island to your hand to counter a spell, unless they pay one. And this synergizes very well with Stifle and Wasteland, so that hopefully they're mana deprived and you just cast this to counter a spell for free. It essentially lets you run Force of Will five through eight 
if your mana denial is working well. Uh, it also lets you bounce lands back to your hand and then shuffle them away with Brainstorm. No, that's a great tip. Yeah. And then next we have Ponder, which is just... Uh, I wouldn't say that it's similar to Brainstorm. They tend to do very different things. Uh, I'd much rather, if I'm keeping a hand with just like a cantrip and disruption, I'd much rather see Ponder in my opening hand because then ideally you can just take the threat or the uh, land that you might need off the top and shuffle the rest away with a fetch next turn. It just, you see more cards. Brainstorm is better as the game goes on. Ideally, in this deck, the best Brainstorm is the one that you never have to cast. It's just added insurance. Ponder more so is for consistency and helping you find what you need in the early stages of the game. Whereas Brainstorm, you want to save until you absolutely have to play it and you need to find like another counter spell to make sure one of their spells doesn't resolve. I, I think that's one of the bigger tips to take away from this is I often see people play this deck and cast, cast brainstorms right away. They end up occasionally brainstorm locking themselves or casting yeah. them too early when they should be casting the ponders. Yeah. Ponder is much better early, when, yep. especially when you're looking for a threat. Yeah, ponder is definitely better for that. Um, I've brainstorm locked myself very many times with this deck, and it just doesn't feel good. This deck, your curve is at two, and if you brainstorm trying to find green mana for a threat when you could have pondered first then you just lost so much tempo because you could have pondered seen that there wasn't a green land in the top three shuffled and then hopefully found it and then next turn if you still don't have green mana then you would probably want to brainstorm because then you're just really behind because you would need to get a threat out quickly Okay, so the next one you've got here, Spell Snare. Tell me about this one. This one's not in everybody's list. So this is the final two cards that I'm running in the six flex spots. Spell Snare, I feel, is very good right now because it's a hard counter no matter what stage of the game you're in. Um, well, that's the definition of a hard counter. Though the thing is many people will try and play around days in the early stages or think, well, he has one card, he can't have Force to this late in the game, and then you just have Spell Snare. Um, it hits a lot of stuff that this deck cares about. It hits Stoneforge Mystic. That way you're not having to like try and find removal for it. You could just save that to kill like Deathrite Shaman or add Reach. It Spell Snare, you know, Snapcaster Mage against Miracles, especially if the game has gone long, is one of the best things you can do against them. It's Counterbalance, uh, Tarmogoyf, Scavenging News, Thalia, just a lot of different things across the meta. Um, it's uh, more or less another Force of Will against Ant because you can counter their um, Infernal Tutor, which is their main engine to win. It's just very good, I think, because it touches on a ton of different decks. And there's really only one deck, uh, Show and Tell, that it's just completely dead against. And even then, they might be running blue-red uh, Omnitel, in which case they're running Burning Wish. So even then, it's still not dead, because they're running Burning Wishes for added consistency. But outside of that, it hits a card, and the cards that you're hitting with it are very important. They're usually some sort of win con or just added value like Snapcaster Mage. Okay. So it's a very, I think, underplayed card and underestimated just because the fact that it counters something at 2CMC no matter what stage of the game of your that you're in, whether you're behind or ahead. So Sneak and Show is probably the only one you pull it out against? Yeah, pretty much. Um, okay. It's good against everything else, I think. And then we have good old Force of Will. And this, you pretty much want to use just counter something and play out a threat at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, that way you're, it plays on the tempo aspect of this, that you're playing out a threat 
and proactively disrupting whatever they're trying to do. That's the nice thing about this threat is that it has force of will and days. So it has eight free counter spells. And this way you'll be able to play out a threat and be tapped out, but still have disruption available. What matchups do you leave force of will in against and do you ever pull it out? So against a lot of fair decks, if you're on the play, Force of Will usually isn't needed that much, especially because it's definitely good at what it does, but Rug Delver has no way to generate actual card advantage. So it's very punishing if you're stuck with a hand of Force of Will, Fork Bolt, Brainstorm, and they're playing out a Goyf, because then you have to force pitching Brainstorm, which is one of our best cards, but we know that we can't beat a resolve goif unless we have like our own goif plus a removal spell, but then we're still trading two cards for one, so we might as well just force. Uh, against fair decks, you can probably shave at least two, if not more, on the play, because that's where this deck thrives. With them being behind a land drop, Days gains more value, Wasteland puts them even further behind, Stifle becomes much easier to play. On the draw, Stifle is arguably one of the worst cards to have. You usually want to shave at least a few copies if you're on the draw, and Force of Will is just good regardless. Mm -hmm. Though against Fair decks, you don't need it too much. If it's against a mid-range deck, you definitely want to keep in like at least two, mm -hmm. because the game... Well, there's a chance that it'll go out of your control and they get to a point where they're at like four mana and can play around Pierce and can play around Days. So you still need free hard counters. Mm -hmm. um, you definitely keep it in against Combo, obviously, and Miracles. You definitely want to keep it in against the Fair decks. There's a bit more leeway as to if you want to cut like two or three on the play or just all of them mm -hmm. you definitely need at least two on the draw let's take a look at the threats that you've got in this deck uh we start out with nimble mongoose which is one of the main reasons to play this deck i think um so he's a one one with shroud for a green mana and then he has threshold where if you get to seven cards in your graveyard he gets plus two plus two so that's the other thing that this deck plays on, that all your threats, or at least eight out of the 12 threats, have some sort of evasion. Mm -hmm. Goose has Shroud. So you don't have to spend mana trying to protect your threats as much as you would in other decks. Mm -hmm. So Goose is very good in the fact that he's essentially almost a true name. It's just that they can still block him, mm -hmm. but he has Shroud, which is the main thing. They can't just abrupt decay him or bolt him or swords. You just don't have to worry. You just put him in play, and then, like, that's one of your best threats against Miracles mm -hmm. because their options are either Snapcaster for probably no value early game to try and trade, which is bad, especially where that's where we thrive having days. They can play a Vendillion click and trade, which is pretty good. Ideally, you have a Bolt so that they can't do that. Or they have to try and find Terminus, which if you have a Goose out and it's at Threshold, they'll probably try and fire off a Terminus as soon as they think they like absolutely have to. So you can easily get Miracles down to just 12 or 10 with Goose before they feel like they have to deal with it, and then you can just stifle the Miracle trigger, mm -hmm. and they have to spend another turn putting it back on top. It's just a very efficient threat that's hard to deal with. So what are your other threats in the deck? Next up, we have Delver, uh, the namesake of the deck. He's just very good. Now we gotta uh, show off the cool Delver that you've got there. Okay, so I got this um, about six months ago i think or so at uh let's see here was it scg portland by zelda the geek um it's a 3d altar with a foreign border delver so that's up above that's very cool very nice 
thing. Yep. So Delver, like Nimble Mongoose, has a form of evasion. Um, Delver flies. And this uh, Rug Delver has, I think, the best flip ratio for Delver because Blue White Red has a few more lands and they also have their Stoneforge package. And then Bug Delver usually runs like some number, they usually run 13 to 14 threats and they also have like maybe one or two Lilianas. So Delver has the best flip ratios in this deck and it flies. So it's not as good as Goose in terms of not having to protect it. You still need to protect Delver with Pierce or Force or something like that. But this way they can't just play out a Goyf or a True Name or whatever they have and just chump block or trade, which is even worse. So this is just the other half of the evasive threat list that you're attacking from two different angles. Goose, they can't remove, so they have to put a threat out to block it or play a Wrath effect. Delver, they probably can't block, so they have to try and find removal as quickly as possible because Delver will kill them very fast. So Delver, uh, if you've got Delver first turn and you've got a Brainstorm in hand, um, do you play the Brainstorm to try to flip the Delver? No, I think that's one of the worst plays somebody picking this deck up could make. Uh, like I said, the deck runs 30 instants and sorceries, so there's at least a 50% chance that it'll flip. And even if it's mid to late game and you've gone through some number of fetches and already gone through some of your threats, then it's probably higher. And like we went over before Brainstorm, you don't want to play in this deck as like filter. You just want to save it as long as possible. Um, the only times that you really want to Brainstorm if you need to flip uh, Delver is when you have two out because then I actually think the upside is enough that you can just burn a Brainstorm. Because your clock is going to be twice as right. fast at that point. Okay. Right. Uh, there's also an interesting interaction that took me a while to understand when I first picked up the deck is playing out a Delver with a fetch land in play is one of the best things that you can do because it effectively adds scry on your upkeep because so upkeep trigger, you look at the top card, let's say it's a land and you already have a fetch and a trop in play, well, that land's bad. So you can just fetch, shuffle it away, and draw a fresh card. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the best ways to utilize uh, Delver to its fullest potential is not only is it a beater, but it also is almost like a cantrip. It just lets you filter your draw step on your next turn, which can sometimes be very relevant. That's a great tip. Okay, what is the last... What have you got here for threat? So, Goyf, the final threat, it's the higher end threat. It's usually a 4 5. It might get a bit bigger, but it's just the best vanilla beater in Legacy. It's definitely the third uh, best creature that you could play in this deck. There is some leeway as to if you're expecting a lot of combo or miracles, I've seen some people cut the fourth Goyf for a Vendillion click which I actually don't think is that bad, especially if you know that there will be, like if you're just in an eight-man tournament and you know that four people out of the eight are running combo, then it's definitely a worthwhile uh, plan because Goyf isn't, it's a threat, but it's also a threat that's at two mana, so it's not that fast. Ideally, we just want to play Delver or Goose turn one and then not have to worry about playing out another threat but this just playing it late game is much faster than delver or goose mm -hmm. so it just helps us recoup some of the tempo that we lost if they have dealt with delver or goose somehow you mentioned there were flex spots in there which are the cards that are in the flex spots so the flex spots how i have them set up are Two Fork Bolt, two Pierce, and two Spell Snare. Okay. What are the other cards that you consider in those spots? So 
This is what I like because I feel like it offers uh, the best diversity between uh, soft counters with spell pierce and days, and your opponents might try and play around one or the other. And then you also have spell snare and force for your hard counters. Mm -hmm. So if they like not play their goif out turn two to try and play around days, and then you just had spell snare, then it's just a huge blowout for them. They gave us so much tempo. Mm -hmm. I think this uh, flex spot distribution gives the deck the most virtual card advantage, I guess is the best way to describe it, mm -hmm. because your opponent has to choose between which one of the four counter spells we have in the deck they want to beat. And then even if they try and beat one, let's say they try and beat days, or they feel really good and they have their, uh, they can play around days and they have spell pierce, then we might just have snare and our own pierce. Mm -hmm. It just gives you a lot of disruption divided evenly enough that opponents will tend to play badly trying to sidestep one and then just running into the other. Okay. So what are other considerations in these spots? So after those, the other main flex spot that you'll see people run is going to be Gitaxian Probe, which this card is actually very good in this deck. Um, I think that if you're going to play it, you definitely want to run it at at least a two or a three of. I've seen some lists run it as like a four of with two pierce, but I think you just don't need that many of them. Um, the value off of it is that it's a cheap cantrip and you can grow goose quickly with it. It also helps you sequence your plays very well. On the flip side, I've had it where... You say sequence your plays, what do you mean? Uh, so it makes Stifle very easy to play because you can tell if they have fetch lands, if they don't, if they have a Liliana that you can use this to counter. Like It makes your brainstorm okay. plays easier if you're thinking, well, if they have Liliana, I could be in trouble here. Do I need to shuffle away or do they just have Goyf, in which case I need to try and find a bolt to attack with my Goyf and kill theirs. It just, the value of having information lets you outplay your opponent. So that's one of the main reasons why you would want to play it. It also makes playing this deck in a very long tournament much easier because you're not having to try and think about every possible iteration of their hand. You just know at least that they have these cards and I can play around them with cards A, B, and C, whether that's Stifle or Pierce or Days or Wasteland plus Days. Mm -hmm. It just lets you sequence your plays and what you need to play around much easier. Okay. What other flex spot cards have you got here? Uh, so the other flex spot for removal is going to be either Dismember or Fire and Ice. Um, they both have their advantages and disadvantages. Dismember lets you kill a Goyf uh, regardless if you have your own threat. That's one of this deck's biggest, I guess, weaknesses is that it can't really overcome an opposing Goyf very easy. Mm -hmm. You have to attack in with your own Goyf and then bolt theirs. So you're still kind of trading... You're trading your bolt for their goif, but you're also losing an attack swing with your threat, which gives them... If they're running goif and they're not Rug Delver, that means that they're running Abrupt Decay. So it gives them another turn to draw Decay or another out to our threat. Mm -hmm. The downside is just the four life is very painful. And like I said earlier, most threats like Delver, Deathrite Shaman, and Mother of Ruins you need to kill the turn that they come out. And it's just very painful to pay for life to kill a Delver on turn one mm -hmm. or to kill a Deathrite Shaman. But the thing is, Deathrite Shaman circumnavigates this deck's main design to just deprive them mana. So you know you have to kill it so that the rest of your cards in the deck that you draw will still have value. Mm -hmm. But still, for life is just a really 
really painful cost to pay to kill death right shaman uh-huh. what else have you got there for flex spots so the other one though is uh fire and ice mm-hmm. and the nice part here is um it's fork bolt for two mana which i don't like that's why i don't really run it uh but ice lets you tap down uh any permanent mm-hmm. and it can trips which can be relevant in the fact that you can tap down their goif and swing in with your goif and goose and then you get seven damage in and then next turn you might just be able to overwhelm overwhelm them with added burn in your hand um the other flip side is that you get to have an added card to pitch to force which doesn't come up often but like i said earlier that like if your hands force fork bolt brainstorm it really hurts to pitch brainstorm to force Mm -hmm. but in this scenario if it's force fire and ice brainstorm you can force pitch fire and ice and then in a few turns refill your hand with brainstorm so it gives you a bit of added flexibility there Mm -hmm. um though it doesn't come up often but it's Mm -hmm. nice to have and then finally i just have the three cards that i am playing in my current flex spot um Though these vary depending on what you want to play and what you expect. If you think there's going to be a lot of combo, then a flex spot configuration of three Gataxian probes, two Pierce, and a Fork Bolt is probably best because Gataxian probe excels at giving you information against combo. Pierce is the best counter spell against combo. And then if you think there's just going to be a lot of combo decks or uh, miracles or just decks like that, then you probably don't need two removal spells. Mm-hmm. And also, Gitaxian Probe helps you dig through your deck deeper and faster. So, so some, you can. Some people run Chain Lightning instead of um, Forked Bolt. Um, why do you like Forked Bolt over Chain Lightning? Uh, Forked Bolt, you have added value in the fact that you can uh, hit two threats um which it doesn't come up often that you gain a whole lot of value but against decks like maverick death and taxes and elves you can at least force them to like tap their mother ruins or something like that to like you force their hand in terms of what they want to save Mm -hmm. um or like against elves they're going you can like hit the wirewood symbiote and force them to bounce their visionary, which is usually just what they want to do anyways. But if you're hitting Wirewood Symbiote, that's the main thing. You're breaking up the best mm-hmm. friend team. Um, and it also might help you in the fact that you can follow it up with like a spell snare to counter their visionary the yeah. next turn. Um, okay. um, Chain Lightning, I've played. Uh, it's definitely... It's good at what it does. I've played this deck with uh four bolt uh two pierce and then uh four chain lightning which i actually really like because if you're running four chain lightning four bolt and two pierce then you're essentially running a blue red delver deck but with much better creatures Mm -hmm. and one of the tricks when you're looking at playing that specific build and also just playing this deck in general is that to look at everyone's life total as 18 because mm-hmm. everyone has fetches or forces something in legacy or ancient tombs or whatever they may have this way it's just all of the threats are at three damage and you're running eight bolts at three damage so it's just you're trying to find six variations of bolt or a threat swing, and you win. Yep. Which four chain lightning or uh, an eight bolt rug delver list is definitely a contender if you're if you especially if you expect to see a lot of fair decks. I found them to just put a lot of pressure on them and let you win out of nowhere by well they have a really overwhelming board presence. Brainstorm. Oh, hey, two bolts. I win. (laughs) Okay, let's take a look at the uh, sideboard. Okay. 
So for starters, we have Pyroblast and Red Elemental Blast, more or less the same thing. There's some weird corner case with them, but essentially the same card. Uh, you usually want to play this at least as a two, if not a three of in your sideboard. It's just too good to not play. Um, the other thing is since True Name came out, it's almost necessary, I'd say, because this deck can't really beat a Resolve True Name. This lets you beat it on the stack, which is the only line of attack we have against it. Mm -hmm. So you definitely want at least two of just for that because True Name blanks eight out of our 12 threats mm -hmm. just by blocking forever. And then also it's just, it's good against combo. It's good against miracles. It's good against like anything that's running blue pretty much. Next up we have Flusterstorm, which I consider one of the best counter spells you could be running in your sideboard for a combo hate. It just lets you win the combo war. If you're playing against like Bug Delver or Blue White Red Delver, it's almost better than Spell Pierce because all those decks, all the Delver decks run on very small and efficient mana bases of just wanting two or three lands out. And if you fluster storm something, trying to make sure your spell snare gets through, then you probably have the final say in the matter of, okay, here's four copies of Force Spike on your Force of Will. Can you deal with that? And most of the time they can't. This is also good against um, Miracles because they tend to play a lot of spells in one turn, whether that's their Brainstorming or Pondering or they play Snapcaster into like Sword Splash Airs to try and deal with your threat. Um, the other nice part about this that you might be able to get with some Miracles player is the Storm Trigger does bypass a Counterbalance Lock because the copies are being placed on the stack. That way if a Miracles player thinks they have the game sealed and they tap out for Entreat, leaving, let's say, one mana up to play around days, and they have Force, you can just fire off, like, an added spell or two into the Counterbalance lock, and then play Flusterstorm and have four copies on the stack. And unless they have their own, then you probably just counter their Entreat, and if you have a threat out, then you just win. Nice. So that's definitely one of the best counter spells you could play in your flex spot. Envelop is a card that I've been testing out lately. You don't usually see it in the sideboard, but I found it to be very good. And I actually think it's better than the third Pyroblast in terms of combo hate. Pyro what does it do? So Envelop, um, it doesn't see a whole lot of play, but it's just one blue counter target sorcery spell. The nice part about this is against any sort of combo, you just counter their main combo piece. Against Show and Tell, it hits Show and Tell. Against Ant, you hit Infernal Tutor or Past in Flames. And against Elves, you can hit Green Sun Zenith, Natural Order, or uh, Glimpse of Nature, all for one mana, especially in the Elves matchup where they have a lot of mana to play around Spell Pierce or Daze. This is just one mana hard counter against all their combo pieces. The other nice part is that this counters Miracle cards because Entreat and Terminus are still sorcery. They're just being played on their draw step. Mm -hmm. So this is very good in that matchup because you can like have a bit of a counter war, but you have more forcible, more hard counters than they do to make sure that their Entreat or Terminus won't resolve. Mm -hmm. It also counters Council's Judgment which is a very, very bad card to see the opponent resolve because Council's Judgment can exile Nimble Mongoose because it doesn't target because of the way the vote mechanic works. Mm -hmm. So this can counter that for one, and if Miracles is trying to just deal with that goose that we've been protecting, and they play that out with, let's say, three extra mana, we can just envelop. And they're like, oh, well... I didn't think you had that because you only have one card and I thought the only thing that would make me lose here is Force Will. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely a card that I think isn't on a lot of people's radar and is a very good addition to the Rogue sideboard. Next up we have Vendillion Click. 
which is a very good tempo threat. So it's three mana, three one with flash and flying. So it hits all the stuff that we want. It has evasion. We can play it out at instant speed so we can leave our options open. And the ability to take a card from their hand and put it on the bottom of their library is very good against show and tell. You can cast it in response and tuck whatever their show and tell card was going to be, whether that's Omniscience or Emrakul or Grizzlebrand, whatever that is. Against Miracles, the way the Miracle trigger works is that they draw Terminus, they reveal it for the Miracle trigger, and in response, it's technically in, I guess, a known part of their hand. You can play Vendillion Click and take the Miracle card and put it on the bottom of their library before they can cast it. Nice. So it's, again, kind of like Stifle, but even better against Miracle cards and the fact that it's a hard counter spell because you just tuck it and put it on the bottom of their library. Stifle just buys you time. This makes sure that you won't have to see it again, hopefully, until they've like pondered or topped or shuffled their library to a point where they found it again. Uh, so what do you pull out to put this in? So against combo decks, you usually want to shave two Goyfs or so because Goyf is our high-end threat against... Uh, it's our highest CMC threat. And against combo decks, you just kind of want to stick one threat. That's all you really need. And just hold up counter magic the rest of the game. Vendillion Click is nice in the fact that you can play it at instant speed, it's disruption, and it's a 3-1, so it's a fairly fast clock. So against combo decks, you usually can just shave two goyfs and put that in. Against miracles, uh, you could shave a goyf and put it in because there's a chance they might bring in rest in peace. Um, I think some miracle lists have shied away from that tactic because dig through time is just so good that they don't want to be running rest in peace, but it's still worthwhile to like shave a goy for a much more effective threat against miracles. Next we have Graph Digger's Cage, which is, so it makes sure that creature cards can enter the battlefield from the library. So that's one of the main reasons why this is in here because it helps against the elf matchup which is very bad. They just have so much card advantage and can grind out that this blanks Green Sun Zenith and Natural Order. So the only way that they can really combo out is either getting Cradle with a bunch of mana to hardcast Crater Hoof or to Glimpse. So that's one of the main reasons why it's in here. The other is players can't cast cards in graveyards or libraries. Um, right. The main part is the graveyard. So that's good against Ant because that's one of their main engines is that against Rug Delver, a good Ant player will see Stifle and actually not care because they'll take Force and Snare first if you have those. And then they'll try and play around Pierce or Daze, which they usually can do if they have uh, Cabal Ritual or Dark Ritual. And then they just flash back with Past in Flames and do Duress again and take Stifle, and then you lose. This stops that so that they have to either find Vapor Snag or they have to naturally Tendrils you, which is much harder for them to play Ad Nauseam if you have a threat out. It's good against that, and it's just good against any decks that are actually trying to use the graveyard to put creatures into play like Dredge, you just side these two in, you play it, and then win. Or against Reanimator, it's really good. They might have a few show and tells, but that's a lot easier to beat because it's at three mana, whereas their actual reanimation spells are at one or two. Rough and Tumble uh, is a card that you'll definitely see a lot of in Rug Sideboards. So the main part is Rough. You will pretty much never cast Tumble. Uh, rough deals two damage to each creature without flying. Mm -hmm. So for us, we don't care because Goose is a 3-3 three, three and Goyce a 3-4. And Rough deals with Maverick, it deals with Elves, it deals with Death and Taxes. 
just all the creature heavy base decks that can sometimes give us trouble. This gives us card advantage, which again is something that Rug lacks. So getting two for ones where you can is important. Next up on the list, we have Submerge, which Submerge is four and a blue. Uh, if an opponent controls a forest, you may, uh, and you control an island, which we always do, uh, you may play this without paying its mana cost, put target creature on top of its owner's library. So essentially this is uh, a free spell to put a goif on top of their library, which is the main mode that it takes. It's also good against elves. You might catch them with a shuffle effect or maverick. Again, like goif, rug delver can't deal with a resolved knight of the reliquary pretty much. So if they, an inexperienced Maverick player might try and fetch up Wasteland and just think they'll win, and then you can submerge it and you dealt with Knight of the Reliquary, and you okay. still hopefully have a threat out, and then they just have an empty board, ideally. Mm -hmm. um, it's also good against... Uh, the uh, One other combo deck, aside from Elves, that this is good against is um, Infect which it's just a house there because it's a free uh, removal spell. They always have a forest in play, so you can just submerge their Ink Moth or Glistener Elf and then not have to worry about it because that matchup is kind of like playing the mirror. We each have a few threats. They just try and pump up their threats, whereas we have a lot of disruption trying to just let our threats kill them over a few turns. And this just lets you wait for them to make the first move, and then you'll bolt, they'll force. There's a huge can of war, and then you can just place a merge and put it on the top of their library. Then next up, we have our two artifact or enchantment hate spells. Usually, you'll want to run at least one, probably two. Frozen Grip is the best against Miracles because it has split second, and they can't respond or do anything. Uh, it's actually very good if you can Crozen Grip a Sensei's Divining Top early because a lot of times they lean on that early on. But if you draw it late game, you can just disrupt a counterbalance lock. Destructive Revelry is really good because it hits both artifacts and enchantments. And there's rest in peace pretty much blanks 8 out of our 12 threats. So this deals with rest in peace, and most decks that we want artifact hate against are going to be Stoneforge Mystic decks, which will probably have rest in peace on the board. So this deals with both their Stoneforge package and a possible rest in peace that we may see. Um, and it's also two damage to the face, which is sometimes relevant. Um, I remember I got to load the dream once and Destructive Revelry, a Rest in Peace, and Shock, a Liliana that had just came into play. <laughs> so nice. that was fun. Doesn't happen often, but it's just uh, more damage and it can deal with a lot of different things. So the other options for the sideboard are Sylvan Library. This card is just very good. Uh, so the official text is something along the lines that the beginning of your draw step you draw two additional cards and then uh put two cards back or pay four life for each one you did not put back so against combo you just use it to gain card advantage and draw more counter spells against miracles i've heard some very good miracles players say that they fear this more than they do a threat because you can just outdraw them, and when you're drawing very counter, uh, very powerful counter spells like Pyroblast and Flusterstorm in conjunction with uh, evasive threat like Goose or Delver, then they're just put on a really fast clock, and you're constantly drawing cards. You can also use it to with fetch lands to just shuffle away bad cards and you can get a lot of value off of chaining Sylvan Library with fetch lands. There's also some scenarios where Sylvan Library, it might not be that one card will get you out of a scenario, but drawing something like Stifle plus Pyroblast will get you out of it. 
or something like Stifle plus Wasteland against the Lands decks might help. There's just some interesting combinations of cards where one might not save you, but drawing two or being able to see more cards will get you there. So that's definitely a good card to think about in your sideboard. Another one that you could look at is Surgical Extraction, which it's essentially free. You just pay two life uh, and you choose a card in their graveyard, look at their hand and their library and exile all of them. Um, one neat trick that you can do with this uh, that is one line of attack, but I think is fairly lucky if it happens is you can waste a tundra or like an underground sea one of their main duels early on and then extract it that's one of the most game breaking things you can do in this deck but it's also very luck based the nice part about this is that it's free so you can just hold it up it's very good against reanimator it's also very good against ant mm -hmm. because they can't Vapor Snag it like they could Graph Digger's Cage. But outside of those scenarios, I think Graph Digger's Cage is just better. Even if it's one mana, it just does more and adds more flexibility against elves. Another card uh, that you might want to look at when you're looking at your artifact or enchantment hate spells is Ancient Grudge because you can not only hit one but two artifacts because of the flashback. Though I've done a lot of thinking about how this compares with Revelry. So if you're playing against uh, a blue-white-red Patriot Aggro Delver deck, let's say you've hit their early GT. They're not going to play out a Batter Skull into an Ancient Grudge that's in the graveyard. Unless they have mana to like bounce Batter Skull, which is still just buying us a lot of time. Uh, they'll probably, if they have time, just wait until they get rest in peace, in which case we only got one use off of this anyways, mm -hmm. and the two damage from Revelry may have been better. And then in reverse, if we draw this after they've resolved rest in peace, then it may as well be destructive Revelry because we get two damage and we'll only get one use off of it anyways. So I think Revelry is a bit better. Grudge definitely excels at just what it's meant to do, destroying artifacts, which if you're playing against a lot of Tesserator decks for some reason, even though that doesn't see a whole lot of play. But Tesserator or robots? Yeah, Tesserator, robots, or mud. If, but those are more fringe-based decks, so I think Revelry is just better. Let's see here. Next, we have Sulfur Elemental, which, like Click, is a flash threat. It's a 3-2, so it has a good clock on it split second so they can't respond and white creatures get plus one negative one which is very very good against any sort of maverick death and taxes any deck like that because you pretty much this is just a mini wrath against mother of ruins and thalia it makes their uh brim just look silly as a four three that you could bolt and it doesn't even make tokens that stick around so it's definitely good if you're expecting a lot of fair creature-based decks like those. Yeah, Lingering Souls, uh, you don't see too often, but this is definitely what you want if somebody's playing Lingering Souls. Life from the Loam is another card. You used to see it a lot more in sideboards. Um, I don't like it too much now because it's kind of a win-more card. If you're lowing in recurring wastelands, you're probably just already ahead with a threat and they're behind on lands anyways. And also the thing that I don't like about it is that it's much harder to play now that Deathrite Shaman is out. And if you're playing against like a bug tempo deck that has days and forcible, it could be very hard to resolve and also get through a Deathrite if that table because they protected that as well. Um, and it's just kind of slow. Like, you need to find Wasteland for it to be good. And then, like I said, if you already have wasted them and you have a threat out, then you're probably ahead. It's only really necessary against, like, lands. But that's such a bad matchup. I wouldn't 
uh, bother to put it in my board to begin with. Next, we have Pithy Needle, which is a very... It's good at what it does and the fact that it's very like useful in a lot of different scenarios. You can name a lot of different creatures uh, like Wirewood or Quarian against Elves, against, uh, what is it, Miracles. You can name Jace the Mind Sculptor or Sensei's Divining Top. You can name Stoneforge Mystic. There's just a lot of different things. Against Death and Taxes, like you could literally name the whole deck. Anything from Rashad on Port to Aether Vile to Mother of Runes. Just anything. Um, so it's essentially just a lot of virtual card advantage. Um, in the matchups that it's good, it's very good. But outside of like Miracles and Death and Taxes and a few others it's not that amazing. And I just think that like having a more consistent card in the sideboard that's like better against one specific deck is better than this card that might be good against a couple of different decks depending on what they draw and what you're able to name. Finally, I've seen some lists run Grim Blobomancer in the sideboard over Rough and Tumble. I don't like it too much. Um, Grim is definitely better in the fact that you can consistently be shooting their creatures down against like death and taxes or elves every turn from the get-go. But the problem is is that A, he's going to eat your graveyard which kind of counteracts Goose. And B, I think if you just wait for them to overextend that you could get the same value in one fell swoop with rough that you could get with Grim Lava Mansa or over the first three turns of the game. So it's, again, kind of a win more card against a few specific decks like Elves and Death and Taxes. So that's kind of why I like Rough more because it's just, you can gain the same value and it's better if you top deck it late game, whereas Grim, if you top deck it, and Elves already has like a ton of creatures out, then Grim is just very slow and does nothing the turn it comes out and gives them time to do stuff. Mm -hmm. Rough is good regardless of when you draw. Here, one last question. What is your favorite matchup and what is your least favorite matchup? Gosh, my favorite matchup has probably got to be Miracles. I've talked with a few Miracles players and they say that it's one of their most skill intensive matchups and I would agree from the rug side as well that there's just a lot of interactions in terms of pyroblast, snare, pierce, deciding like if there's a terminus on the stack, if you should burn a brainstorm just to try and find a stifle mm -hmm. because you know you need to keep your thread around, uh, trying to see what they're going to do next in terms of should I keep snare over pierce here mm -hmm. there's just a lot of decisions that you need to make and that's what I like about it it's a very skill intensive matchup and I've played it numerous times against some very good miracles players and I still think it's just a toss-up match 50 50 could go either way mm -hmm. there's just so many different variations of well, they might have Terminus, but I have Stifle. They have Sword Splashers, but I have Goose. Mm -hmm. They might have Snapcaster, but then if I have Snare, then it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Or gaining Pyroblast out of the board on both sides gives value in terms of winning Counter Wars, and they have another answer to deal with Delver. It's just a very fun matchup. Um, as for my least favorite matchup, Lands is probably the most one-sided matchup this deck has because they just attack on such a different angle that this deck wants to play on. This deck wants to proactively counter spells, whereas Lands plays one or two spells. They'll maybe play a Gamble or an Exploration turn one, and then after that, they're just recurring Loam they have a combo that you can't really interact with. At most, you can wasteland their whichever uh, copy they keep after they make a copy with uh, Thespian Stage of Dark Depths, in which case the way the trigger works is that 
the dark depths has to stay around uh, until the trigger resolves. So if you waste it with the trigger on the stack, then they just don't get a 2020, but they're still going to recur it. They have punishing fire, they have loam and Rashad on port and wasteland. They also have Maze of Ith to deal with Delver and Goyf. It's just a very bad matchup. The only matches where I've found that I've beaten uh, lands is where I've had a lot of geese so that they can't deal with my threat and that I've like countered Loam every time that they've played it with Days, Pierce, Snare, Force, and then hopefully they're just banking on trying to get Loam to resolve just once so that they could get like that that's the main stage out of their graveyard that because like a grindy game. yeah because if they're just continuously dredging loam trying to get at whatever's in their graveyard they're not drawing cards so if i have a threat out then i'm okay with that but they still just have so many answers for our threats and can combo off and it's a combo in a fashion that we can't really deal with mm -hmm. because they're just making a 2020 like at best they have a Taiga in play and we submerge it. Like that that's our best option against them. <laughs> that matchup's just very depressing. Thank you so much, James. Greatly mm -hmm. appreciate it. Uh, here's the deck list that everybody has been waiting for. In closing, I just want to say a huge thank you to James Johnson for doing this video. I've known James for over three years now as he's been working on this deck. Uh, we actually played some play test games many years ago when he asked me to play standard and I said that I only had legacy decks with me. I lent him my legacy rug deck at the time and shortly after that he proxied it up and started to trade for it which took him a significant amount of time to trade into this deck. Uh, while he was trading for it he would borrow cards from people and play in the local legacy tournaments. Uh, he has really learned this deck the way that a master painter learns how to paint and I'm so happy to have a great interview with him that really captures a lot of his knowledge around the deck. Uh, for people who are interested in creating this deck, this is not a budget deck. This is a very expensive deck, mostly because of what has happened to the price of dual lands in the last few years. There are no real budget alternatives to this deck. There are decks that do have a similar feel to it that do cost less. I think Infect is about the closest where you're able to save not having the volcanic islands only going after tropicals and your main deck spells end up costing a bit less because you don't have Goyce. But overall, this is a tier one amazing legacy deck that it's worth proxying up to learn how to play against it. And it is a deck that rewards skill and knowledge of the environment. This is one of my absolute favorite decks personally to play. This video is the first video that I've really done in this format. I would really appreciate to hear people's feedback on the style. This is what I had envisioned when in Patreon I said that I would be doing deck text. This video takes a lot longer than other videos to create. We shot about two hours of footage and I spent about eight hours cutting and editing this film. I think the quality of it is definitely worth it. This is something I wouldn't have been able to do except for the support from everybody who is over there on Patreon. Thank you guys so much for supporting the channel. I look forward to creating more high quality content for you guys. If there is content that you would like to see in the future created, please consider becoming a supporting member of the channel on Patreon and letting me know. That is the best way to get a voice into the direction that this channel heads.